Okay. Good afternoon. It's December 7th. It's a BOCC work session, and we're here, and staff's got some live presentations for us today. You want to go first, Roger, you first? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioners, um, we've been talking about these LDC amendments for a while now, and I promised to bring them back to you in sort of bite-sized pieces, and this is one of those bite-sized pizzas, pizza, pizzas, pieces. Uh, so, Glenn, would you please introduce the, uh, the item? Yes, sir. Thank you, Roger. Uh, commissioners, as, as the county manager just indicated, you'll recall that in previous LDC amendment cycles, we brought gargantuan packages to you that were hard to digest. The public had a hard time sorting through them, and quite frankly, even the review committees had a challenge with sorting through all of it. So we have committed to do this in much more manageable pieces. Already this year, you have um, gone through the cleanup amendments, which are done. Uh, we're in the process now, of course, of trying to get through uh, food truck amendments. Uh, just this morning, you authorized mining depth uh, amendment to go through the committee process, and now uh, we come before you with a package of largely unrelated amendments, but we want to get through them with you um, because there's still more following this. So what I'm describing is what has become more of a continuous process so that you can take it in more manageable sizes. So Dave Loveland will go through all of the proposals with you and just recall that uh, we will be asking you on January 18th for authorization to take these amendments through the committee review process, the Land Development Advisory Code Committee, the Local Planning Agency, and the Executive Regulatory Oversight Committee. So depending on the outcome today, that will be the ask of you on January 18th. Any questions before we go to the presentation? Any questions so far for staff? All right, take it away, Dave. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good to see you. Um, since everything's been introduced, I'll just move right through the, through the slides here. Um, we're going to touch on a number of topic areas uh, as an introduction to these items before we bring them back for authorization to proceed on the 18th. Um, we're going to cover a series of hearing examiner related topics. Uh, first, um, these relate to the responsibilities of the hearing examiner, the idea is to try to do some streamlining and perhaps reduce the number of hearings that might be required. Um, so there's, there's a whole series of those. We're also going to cover the casitas in the recreational, um, uh, rec recreational vehicle plan development zoning category. That stemmed from some board direction at a zoning hearing previously. An update of the dock and shoreline regulations, which the industry had approached us about updating and trying to de uh, develop some consistency with some uh, surrounding jurisdictions in terms of our rules. So we're working through, through them on this uh, and getting their feedback as we go forward. Some update of the single family building design standards, which uh, is necessary because of a recent change in state law, and we need to be consistent with that, and an update of our noise ordinance. So the main question as we get to the end of this is, do you want to see any revisions to the drafts um, prior to beginning the committee review process? And uh, you should have all received a notebook that has a copy of all of the draft amendment proposals within that that's tied to, uh, to this presentation. So starting off with the hearing examiner related amendments, the first one is related to code enforcement procedures. This corresponds to tab one in the notebook. Um, the issue that we have is we have two types of agreements that happen in our process right now. If uh, somebody who's been issued a violation notice wants to enter an agreement prior to a hearing being scheduled, then we call that a compliance agreement, and that's done at the staff level. If a hearing is scheduled, then they actually have to go through with the hearing in front of the hearing examiner. Um, and there's an agreed order that the hearing examiner would be part of um, that is issued on there. What we're proposing is kind of consolidating that, having just one agreement type, a code enforcement agreement um, that can be entered into at any point, whether the hearing is scheduled or not, to try to, to make that more streamlined and, and uh, reduce some of the administrative time and costs. The second issue 
is related to delegation of some decision making, the second and third ones both. This relates to conventional rezoning requests. Um, it's, it's worth noting that our current land development code already delegates some zoning decisions to the hearing examiner now for county in initiated rezonings to environmentally critical category, for example. This is a proposal right now for conventional rezoning, and conventional rezonings are different from planned development zonings that have conditions. Conventional rezonings, you have a zoning category, it has requirements, it has allowable uses, it has certain requirements that you have to meet. So if you're going from one category to the next, it's really just a matter of meeting the requirements for that particular category as outlined in our code. Um, so there haven't been any denials of conventional rezoning requests, they tend to be fairly uncomplicated over the last seven years. Um, so what we're proposing is, and, and uh, all these hearing examiner related items have been vetted through the hearing examiner and the county attorney's office, so, so we have agreement at this point on, on the language. We're proposing a single hear public hearing in front of the hearing examiner rather than the two public hearings to make final decisions on these conventional rezoning changes. Um, but the applicant does have the option, the way we've outlined it, to request the second public hearing step in front of the Board of County Commissioners if they so desire. They would have to make that call um, prior to the hearing examiner hearing so that it's, everybody's aware that there would be a follow-up hearing to that. Somewhat related uh, for plan developments and planet unit developments for modifications to those existing ones, um, there's a, a proposal here to allow the hearing examiner to make the final decision for some types of amendments. If you're amending the master concept plan, the schedule of uses, as long as you're not increasing density or intensity for the existing project, um, requests for uh, additional fuel pumps for convenience stores, consumption on premises, wireless communication facilities, and some changes to conditions. It's intended to be minor types of changes. Um, looking at the plan development amendments that have been done between 2014 and 2020, this would have affected about 42.5% of the cases um, that ended up coming in front of the board. And like the conventional rezoning delegation, there would be the option for the applicant to request a second hearing in front of the Board of County Commissioners if they choose to go that route. Dave, what, what, what page is that out of the notebook? Uh, this one for the PD amendments is, corresponds to tab three, and the prior one corresponds to tab two for the conventional rezonings. Thank you. Sorry, I'm pretending I, I understand everything you're saying, but I really don't understand any of it. Uh, first, give me the simple uh, definition of a conventional rezoning request as opposed to a non-conventional one. <clears throat> uh, a conventional zoning categories are, are the, the long-standing zoning categories like RS1 or C1, a, a commercial zone or a residential zone. They have a, a, a list of uses that are laid out in the, in the land development code. These are the things you can do in that zone. These are some of your setback requirements or height requirements or things like that. So those conventional zoning categories exist. We still utilize them, but a lot of the cur uh, more recent zonings have all gone the plan development route, where they're doing a specific development on a piece of property and they want their own conditions and deviations from the code requirements, and that's all handled through a plan development instead of just going through this conventional zoning process. But well, you said we hardly ever have any conventional we, requests? We do have them. Um, they, they still exist, and we do have requests to amend them or go to different categories. It's not as, as many as the plan development zonings. And as I noted, we haven't denied any conventional zoning requests in the last seven years. So this, uh, 
<clears throat> I guess the process is here. We're walking through these, and if we don't suggest any changes, you're going to take these on to the advisory committees and move forward? Uh, not yet. We would, we would come back to you in January with a, uh, an agenda item to officially get authorization. Yeah, to but take through the since if we're not suggesting any changes, we're going to see in January what we're seeing now. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Uh, Commissioner, but between now and uh, next time, uh, we can you know, spend as much time as you like reviewing all of this, and um, if you have recommendations that we can then incorporate into the January conversation. There's not much risk of your having to suffer through that. All right. In my case. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm trying to get it out of my system yeah. today. Make that offer to um, all, all board members or anyone else. And, and just to note for the record, we have been in, in the drafts of the, the amendment language, we've been including annotations that indicate initially what the staff thinking was and the reasoning behind a particular change. As we go through the committee review process, that's also where we can add the committee comments related to, to those changes. And there's okay. likely to be changes in the end. Well, uh, before you go, let me finish on the conventional. In essence, this is going to take a conventional zoning out of our jurisdictions and let the hearing, of, uh, hearing examiner deal with that. Essentially, yes. With those few right, right. that we have that are usually non-controversial anyway. My concern is, and we've all heard from constituents that say, uh, you guys are afraid of uh, zoning matters and uh, you should let us talk to you and we don't like the way that you shut yourself out of the process until the last minute. And I, I'm just preparing myself for any, anybody that's mad about the conventional to be able to say just what we've been talking about here, that you're not going to be complaining about a conventional zoning matter. They all take care of themselves and they're not controversial in most cases. Uh, but it's the ones that do come to us that I want to be able to defend myself when you're making it appear that we're even more distant from the public and trying to isolate ourselves in those cases. That's where I'm headed from, and I don't know whether there's anything you're doing that responds or exacerbates what I'm thinking in some way. Just thinking out loud with my colleagues here. <clears throat> but isn't it circumvented by the applicant's request and your yeah. desire if they want to right over here? Get it. <clears throat> oh, sorry. The bottom line. The bottom line. So isn't um, what Commissioner Mann's concerned about really it's the applicant who decides not to go through um, that process. They have the opportunity to say they'd rather come to us directly anyway. They want to go past that. So I hear what Commissioner Mann's doing, but what I'm hearing another safeguard is, is that they do have, the applicant has the opportunity to go through the regular process and they still get before, they still have the opportunity to come before us. So what you're doing from an administrative point of view is the people that don't believe that process needs to take place, you just go through and deal with it administratively. So I think your buffer is in there to resolve it because the people that are engaged are going to opt to go through the normal process. That's my two cents. Maybe I just simplified it. I think the concern, I think what Commissioner Mann was saying, I think I think we all probably have the same concern. Like you said, the people at Apple has a choice, but then we all know, and everybody knows 30 years ago, the old way of doing it, you know, the applicant can go to both sides. If you go to the, hear the hearing examiner, it can come to the BOCC, then you have controversy, then, you know, people go to jail over that stuff. So the way it is now is cleaner because you have a basically a judge sending an ex parte communication, making decisions based upon land use laws and code without any type of emotions, without looking at, but the problem is then we're the elected officials, like kind of like in the Briar Club people this morning, they expect us to change the world when we don't have the authority to do that. And what happens then in zoning, we all heard it, you know, we can't talk to you, but we can talk the heck for three minutes and then we have to follow the law, otherwise pay the price. And I think that's the frustration. Um, we still, I, mean, I still get approached every once in a while about why don't you change the rules where we can come talk to both sides. Well, you could do that, but somebody in the future, some other commissioner I mean, in the future may not speak to you. So it doesn't matter, you can change the rules, but um, 
you know, I think my concern would be losing type of venue for public input. That would be a concern. But overall, the process is going to go through the process that's going to be done based upon land use. And we have the HEX's decision. And we can disagree with it. As long as we have competent substantial evidence, we can go against the HEX and win. We've been successful with those court cases before, too. So, I mean, but then some drag out like 13 years, like the um, farm on Corsica Road, 13 years, that mining case went on. We wound up losing it. But, you know, it's the, the downside of it. So I understand what, what Commissioner Wayne's saying, because the applicant could go this way, but if they do, then that somebody's not going to be happy if they go choose that way where there's not a um, our, our part being involved in it. You know, they're going to feel left out or something to a certain point. But if we've had seven, if we've had seven years of a process, right. and and we can clean up a lot of things just administratively. I mean, we all sat in hearings that we've been there for 12 minutes. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, agree. I think that's, that's what we're trying to do is identify those to streamline this process. And I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I have the least tenure here, but I've sat in enough um, public hearings and zoning hearings that you know, they've literally taken 15 minutes and staff could have did it like that. Well, exactly. Yeah, that's what I was saying like today. It was a lot of fun. Huh? <laughs> I said, like, you should have been here eight years ago. We were having a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> we had a lot of really knocked down drag outs. No, I'm just kidding. No, we're glad you're here now for sure. Yeah, um, but no, you're right about that. There's some things, like I said this morning, like lane use decisions, the development order part, we don't get involved with where the interest exit of a community is going to be. That's a land use development, site development issue that staff handles between DOT, water management, and everything else. So no, we shouldn't be in, we shouldn't be involved with that because we're not experts in that field. That's the you know that's the problem with that. I mean in a similar regard, I mean, you know, Santa being the most restrictive, we still um, you know basically did what we're doing here is to try to carve out what we believe administratively can be done. And I can tell you, you know, and I don't mean any disrespect to any other municipalities, no one has a stricter land development code than Sanibel does. And if we could administratively do it, I don't know why we couldn't pick out what we need to do administratively here in the county. Still need a McDonald's over there, though. <laughs> <laughs> that happened, Cecil. <laughs> Mr. Chair, that, Commissioners, um, when, when these... Um, like when these things go through, through the administrative process, staff still is compelled to follow the land development code. So they don't. They don't get to make up the rules as they go along. Right. There is there is well established code um, that these requests are measured against, and so in this case, it's um, they are like you say non controversial. As long as somebody complies with existing code, then away we go. Right. Um, two things. One is we're we're only a few slides into this, but we're talking about shifting work, you know, to the more work to the hex. My, my question is, do we have the capacity internally to do that without forcing a delay? Because I've seen a couple other departments within the county that are trying for efficiency, and, and through a lot of different things, they're, they're actually falling behind. And that causes a lot of angst, you know, uh, in the county. So my, my question is, do we have the capacity, you know, and, and look at this realistically and not get behind? So, I, I mean, the proof will be when, as we work through it. The, the answer is it's not going to create any more work. The hearing examiner will already make recommendations to the board in these conventional rezonings. The difference would be it would be a final decision by the hearing examiner, not just a recommendation. So it's not going to change the, the workload of the, the staff or the hearing examiners in any bit. Unless they decide they want to go. But if the applicant decides they want to come to the board, We'll the HEX would just have a recommendation at that point. Okay. If I could, too. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I have a question. So is the HEX, the HEX, she's not here, is she today? Is she okay with all this? She's been over this, your office has gone over this, all this with her? We, we've had multiple meetings with the hearing examiner and her staff to go over the proposed language, and we're all on the same page. In the future, I'd love to have her here personally so we can ask her, too, about this is going to affect their office. <laughs> And have their input too. It'd be great if the hex was here for that. If everybody agrees with me on that. Yeah. If I could, I do have some statistics that came out of our conversation with Commissioner Hammond in, in the briefings related to how many cases we actually have been dealing with and how many public participants have been involved. So for the year 2014, we had eight rezoning cases, 11 total uh, participants in that pro that whole year. Nine cases in 20. 15, 13 total participants, 
seven cases in 2016, seven total participants, five cases in 2017, zero public participants, five cases in 2018, nine participants, nine cases in 2019, 13 participants, 15 cases in 2020 with 16 participants, and six cases in 2021 for, with four participants. So that, I asked for those statistics, um, you know, and, and thank you, Jay, Dave, for, for getting those to us, because that, that goes, I was thinking the same way you were thinking, Commissioner Pendergrass, about what, what is the public comment and what is the public input here, and, and was the public going to lose out on that public uh, uh, opportunity to come speak before the board, but it sounds like uh, what's, what's being told to us about these being mostly non-controversial cases bears out, and even the numbers, it doesn't sound like there isn't a, 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 a large number of public participation even with these cases. So, um, you know, I think the, the, the wisdom in streamlining these does seem to make a lot of sense. Right. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I mean, just one other factor that we looked at as your staff, and that is, as you all well know, participating in the land use development process is lengthy at times and costly. And this is a situation where we seek to strike a balance between eliminating unnecessarily, unnecessary cost and time delay, but still protecting the public interest. And the public interest is protected by having a public hearing before your designated hearing officer, but yet from the applicant's perspective, you shave off an additional hearing uh, that many times saves time and money in the development business. And these types of conventional rezonings, they're typically not proffered by what we would call the big boys of development. They tend to be smaller aspects, uh, you know, mom and pops in some circumstances. So time is money and delay is damages. So that, that was an added factor that we weighed into uh, this request. Any other comments or let Dave continue? Dave, go ahead and continue. All right, thank you. Um, the, the next issue relates to uh, changes to the hearing examiner recommendations. Uh, once we've gone through the hearing process with the hearing examiner and she makes recommendations for the board hearing, uh, occasionally we'll have the applicants uh, at the last minute want to try to make changes to the recommended, recommended language from the hearing examiner. Um, sometimes just a few days in advance, sometimes at the hearing itself, which puts the board in an awkward position of how to weigh those kind of changes at the last minute. What we're proposing is setting up a process that would require, if somebody is looking to change the hearing examiner recommendations, providing a written submission 14 days in advance of the board hearing so that the hearing examiner has a chance to weigh in on what's being proposed. Sometimes there are minor changes and tweaks, sometimes they're significant, so then the board can weigh uh, the hearing examiner's thoughts on those changes at the hearing and have that information that you're, that you're ready. I, I like this one, commissioners, because I think all of us have been at a hearing where, uh, where the applicants brought something up last minute that's just slightly different than what the hearing examiner proposed, and then we've got to turn to our staff and kind of make, make policy right on the fly. I think, I think this is a good one. I like the little bungalow RV thing that we had a few months ago with, with uh, I think, I forget the applicants, it was Neil Montgomery brought that up, wanted to change the name of the, the language of the room used at a campsite. And with your assets to change it right there, and it was really you know, fortunate, but you know. Well, I'm agreeing with Commissioner Hammond. If this will limit those occasions where we find ourselves dragging you into the thing, and uh, staff on the other side, and the applicant on the other side, at the last minute, I hate those situations. Uh, and the decisions that come out of them, I question whether they're always the best uh, as a matter of policy. So, and that's this, you're going, hey, community development, is that what you're trying to save us from? Yes, sir, yes, sir. And it, it, it makes the process cleaner and more transparent for the board and for the public. What a guy, is he special or what? Yes. <laughs> Uh, moving on for another hearing examiner related amendment, um, this would um, set up a process for dealing with amendments to developments of regional impact. We've 
uh, had developments of regional impact for many years, but the rules related to those have uh, pretty much been um, gutted through a number of changes over the years legislatively. So we don't see new ones typically, but we have a lot of old ones that exist out there and occasionally they need to make changes to their projects. Um, we also need to update our regulations to be consistent with the current state statutes. So what we're proposing is a process where for an amendment, for a revision to a DRI, staff would actually prepare a staff report, analyze and prepare a staff report that goes to the hearing examiner. The hearing examiner would issue a recommendation to the board within 14 days and then the board would have a hearing so it would be a single hearing process. Um, our focus from a staff standpoint and, and the hearing examiner standpoint would really be looking at consistency with our land development code and the LEAP plan in terms of those changes. And the last hearing examiner related item is re related to administrative appeals. The land development code now actually delegates to the hearing examiner the ability to hear appeals or a number of administrative actions taken by staff, but it's spread literally throughout the land development code in a number of different places. So what we're proposing to do is clean that up and put everything in one section um, of the land development code, 34.145. So everything related to appeals to the hearing examiner would be laid out there. What, what the hearing examiner can consider, what can be appealed, what's the standing to appeal, all of the issues that related to the appeal process all in one place. So, so staff and the hearing examiner and the public can all find it in the same place. So moving on to non-hearing examiner related proposals. Um, we've talked about this one before. This is the idea of adding a definition of casita as an allowable use, um, an accessory building on an RV lot, which can uh, include kitchen and sleeping facilities. Um, this came out of a discussion at a zoning hearing. <clears throat> if you'll remember, our regulations allow cabanas, coach cabanas, which allows space, but you're not supposed to have a full kitchen, you're not supposed to sleep in there, which actually is a difficult thing to enforce. The board direction was let's, let's allow for these casitas. So we've proposed that, we've tried to make it subject to, in order to maintain the density rules, it is an accessory building to the RV lot. So it has to be in conjunction with an occupied RV lot. Um, and it's subject to some size and setback requirements. Uh, and things like that. And we've added a provision for those those projects that exist that have the RVPD zoning, they can come back and then request an administrative amendment to add the casita as an allowable use. That's what I was talking about before from early in the year. Uh, next, we have our dock and shoreline regulations. Um, currently, they're all part of Chapter 26 of the Land Development Code. The, as I noted, the industry had asked us to look at some updates. Uh, our our uh, codes are pretty dated. They were looking to uh, try to make it consistent with other jurisdictions. Um, you know, it's important to note that the land use, the density that's established by the land use determines the number of slips that are allowed. For example, a single family home can have two slips. Um, so we've been working with the committee. We've had a couple of back and forth on language and I think we're getting close to finalizing that uh, in a way that is acceptable to them. We do have to try to maintain consistency with the Manatee Protection Plan. That's a critical component in, in the regulations that we're looking at. Um, so you can see that it does affect a number of sections. There's, there's going to be amendments to a number of sections in that Chapter 26 as part of this process. We've also uh, brought a package related to single family building design standards. This is a revision to our land development code to, that's necessary because of a recent uh, legislative change the uh, legislation preempted our regulations related to building design elements, which tend to be exterior type building design elements um, that are listed in the middle there, the exterior cladding, roof structure, 
garage location orientation, windows and doors, architectural styling, that sort of stuff. So it is going to, uh, it, it does still allow us to regulate things like height and, and bulk, the orientation, location on the lot, um, and buffering, those sorts of things. So we need to update our regulations. It is going to affect um, some of the community planning areas where they had attempted to establish regulations that dealt more with aesthetic issues in terms of the looks of houses, single family homes and two family dwellings. So updates will be necessary in chapter 34 and some of chapter 33. And last we have an update to the noise ordinance. Yes, you hold just a second, please. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yeah, go ahead, Roger. Commissioners, um, the first six slides that we reviewed with you were all related to hearing examiner changes, uh, change in the process, and I have to tell you, I'm a little uncomfortable uh, presenting uh, to you hearing examiner authority changes without the hearing examiner being here to have the conversation with you as well. Um, so which is not to say I think we ought to stop, we should continue to go forward, but uh, with your permission, uh, I would very much like to ask her to please be at least in attendance uh, where these are, uh, where the, when this comes back to the board, uh, in, in case there are questions of the hearing examiner. Um, you know, right now we, we present hearing examiner findings on zoning cases, which also makes me very uncomfortable. The staff does that. Um, and I'm, you know, I have for a long time really wished that the hearing examiner would be here to present those findings themselves so that we don't find ourselves inadvertently in conflict between staff and the hearing examiner. It's something we never want to do. So um, just something for you to please consider and, you know, you can, you know, at your leisure, let me know how you feel. I totally agree with that. I just assumed with that, and I didn't make a personal invitation, I just assumed that they would be here doing the presentation for this. I was. Glad to see Dave, but I was surprised that someone from the office wasn't here to provide this information. But if next time they're invited to provide this information, I mean, obviously this data was collected and their input was involved, right? Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to hear from them too. And same thing with the hearing. I know it's frustrating me doing the hearing examines when we have staff recommendation we have is different than the hearing exam recommendation. So under the process, we're supposed to go with the HEX's recommendation, we have the staff recommendation. Well, I've always said, why don't we have the HEX presenting instead of the hearing exam staff giving us their version of it? But that's something we can discuss later about maybe in the future. They don't have to have hearing exam meetings on Wednesdays when we have hearings. They could alternate those days if there's a conflict or scheduling or something. You know, sometimes they're five minutes, sometimes there's just two hours. But I think they should be able to find the time to do that. What, what would you uh, envision it looking like? I mean, would she, uh, so like at a typical zoning hearing we have uh, where the staff introduces the item now, would you imagine that uh, like the hearing examiner would get up and actually present her recommendation and some highlights from it or what would it look like? It could be that. It's something we could discuss you know, later about what that would look like, what would they envision, because that's something they have a conflict with what, how staff presents their opinion they go against just hearing the HEX's recommendations. So instead of having staff stand there telling us they're against it because of this, why not have the HEX be able to tell us why they qualified that land use decision on that grounds. It makes it would make it easier. I think it also would help us in the cases in the future if there's ever type of um, a challenge. We have staff denying it, HEX recommends it. We don't have grounds to deny it. We have to go with the HEX. So many challenges based upon the staff's recommendation it puts the county in a bad place. Mr. Is Chairman, this a thought? If I may, just on that point, Rogers folks in our office have worked very hard over the past two years to create more of a, a pyramid type decision making process when it comes to staff analysis and reports, recognizing that it's the HEX that issues that recommended order. In the old days, um, you might end up with either our office or um, DCD staff or, or whomever being called upon to appear before the Board of County Commissioners and they have an opinion that differs from the hex. Well, that, that's a difficult situation at best. 
the Board of County Commissioners in the past created the HEX, the Office of the HEX to issue you recommended orders. And that's where I go back to the pyramid. Both DCD staff and the County Attorney's Office had our opportunity to participate in the process before the HEX. She then listens and makes a determination and issues an order. That should not and has not in the recent past given either DCD staff or our office a second bite at the apple to argue our position before the Board of County Commissioners. We defer to the HEX's order. She's the board's designated decision maker. The difficulty comes in is when you have a HEX recommended order that's proffered to the Board of County Commissioners and she's not there to answer your questions. It's difficult for DCD staff in our office to be in the mind of the HEX and answer questions as to why she decided on a certain point, especially if we held a contrary position below. So uh, we're completely on board and, and we would fully support that when the HEX issues a recommended order to you all, that she be present to answer your all's questions about her recommended order. I mean, I, I don't have any heartburn with it. It's kind of the will of the board. It's a, you know, zoning's a tough, tough time anyways as it is. So it, I think the more input, the better. It, it would be uh, would be great because we all get the full record. We get a chance to read the full record right. and her findings and conclusions prior to going to the meeting. Um, but then there's certain there certainly is the ability then to ask about, okay, so this is in the record and why, what was the rationale behind it? And uh, Absolutely. Yes, sir. I think the 14 day thing helps a little bit where we won't get, you know, blindsided at the hearing with the new, you know, somebody bringing something at the hearing with a new condition yeah. without the hex's review of it. So I think that 14 day process is going to help us so that doesn't happen. So it would be great, better to have their opinion up front though. I, I mean, from my two cents, I think it would only help the process if she was there. and. Um, question two come up, and we all rely on presentations that are made to us. We read, we go over it, we have briefings, but yet there's still questions. So why not afford us the opportunity to ask whatever questions of that body? I mean, to me, it just makes common sense. And we're going to make a change, and now's the time to make the change, because I agree with what everyone said, and I think would love the opportunity, especially when there's conflict, to be able to have whatever questions I want to ask. Is there another book workshop scheduled after this one for more follow-up? No. no, this is going to come before us. That's not, yeah, anyway. said, that's not said that we yeah. um, so, can't schedule it. I'm just saying it'd be great the next meeting have her there, um, so Donna Marie and Amanda both can be there to hear what we're talking about and see to give their input too. At the very least, yeah. You know, I mean. Certainly would like her part of the process. Right. Hey, Commissioner, there's certainly no harm, no foul to repeat this workshop. Um, who makes the invitation to the HEX as, as chair? Would that be something you, you would make the invitation to her? We could do it on behalf of the board. I mean, yeah. she, they work for the BOCC. We could do that. Right. So say in the next workshop, please attend. We'll discuss these updates and, you know. The will of the board, she's works for us. That's right. So we could do that. So from a direction point of view, I certainly would like us to extend the invitation and let the chair facilitate. Yeah. Ray, Ray? Just direction. What do you think? I'm just, <clears throat> what comes to mind is be careful what you pray for, that it might come true. <clears throat> I'm trying to envision uh, the hearing officer at our meeting, at his own meeting, and her staff sitting down there saying one thing, <clears throat> and it'd be one of those rare exceptions where a staff and a hearing examiner are going in two different directions, and we're going to sit there and witness a, uh, a debate. Uh, <clears throat> her job, as I understand it, and it says in every one of our zoning hearings, the first two pages says, her job is to uh, figure out what the county commission meant when it adopted this particular standard. 
uh, and the, the, usually the staff and her office come down on the same side. And usually we just rubber stamp it because that's the easiest thing to do. But I'd, I'd be interested to hear what she has to say after we invite her here to say, you want me to start a, uh, weigh, weighing in on policy development because we're the one that ultimately tells him what to write in these books. I don't think, we, we, I don't think staff would be given the presentation to be the hex, then. am I right? So it would be staff against the hex. What are we asking the staff, to, what the, the hex to come in and participate in? Okay, Mr. Chair? Go ahead, Roger. Glenn, can you help us out a little bit? Yeah, thank you, Roger. Commissioners, I, I think what I would envision, if, if this makes sense to everyone, is the staff would still introduce the item and make the uh, initial presentation uh, because all we are presenting is the HEX's recommended order. We're not taking a, a staff position that might have been different when she heard it. So, so we are presenting that to you. And then she would be there to answer any questions you have about it because I think uh, the county attorney is correct. We do have a hard time articulating the reasoning behind all of her orders if, if we perhaps had a different position going into the initial hearing. Uh, so just, just to recap, mechanically, I think it's still a staff presentation to introduce the item, but they, uh, the hearing examiner there is there as the resource to really explain that, that reasoning behind what it. What are we going to ask her to do at this second workshop that we're about to throw together? We what could are ask the questions that we're putting to her? Would she want to attend the hearing examiner meetings and provide the, present the case in case there's any questions from us, from the board, related to the case that she Does she want to attend the zoning meeting? Yes. Yes. The, yeah, well, yes. We'll attend, attend the zoning. <clears throat> so she'd be there in case we got things we don't understand about her recommendation. Any clarity? <clears throat> clarity, clarification. But otherwise, we're having staff to tell us, or based upon what we read in her report, but when something comes up like we've had in the case before, like the RV site, there's no findings for those conditions because it's something new. If she's there, she can tell us, yes, we can do that administratively or no, it has to go back for a rezone or something. So if there's new conditions brought up, but I think that would 14 day thing would take care of that to a certain point. But yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner, the uh, purpose for being at this meeting is, you know, we, we, we presented six slides uh, uh, on hearing examiner related LDC amendments and the question was asked does, does the hearing examiner agree with us and we we responded yes but that does not give you the opportunity to ask ask the hearing examiner questions uh, as to gain more clarity on the the changes that are being proposed what Mr. Loveland is doing and he's in an unenviable position of having to convey to the county commission her intent and um, it just, uh, I'll just tell you, it just makes me uncomfortable. It has for a long time um, because that sometimes it gets just a little awkward. Who, um, who proposed these uh, recommendations from the hearing examiner? Didn't they come from her? Dave, P, uh, Glenn? So yeah, some of them came from her and some of them came from staff and we worked through them. Okay. Um, the other question I had too, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just, asking because I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, whose legal advice would we rely on if the hearing examiner is in the room and our county attorney's office is in the room? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman? Yep. Again, it would, it, it's our intent in bringing this issue forward mm -hmm. that the hearing, the hex would be present to answer questions on her order. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> She's an attorney as well. Right. And presumably, uh, she would follow <coughs> um, I would not necessarily anticipate a situation where we would stand up before the Board of County Commissioners and make a contrary recommendation to what the HEX has recommended. That's that pyramid process that I spoke about earlier. But the upshot of this discussion is so that if you have a question on her order, hypothetically speaking, 
uh, the applicant wants to develop a gas station and wants to put in eight parking spaces and staff thinks it should be 11 parking spaces and she splits the baby and says 10. Well, you get to the hearing, you might ask us, well, why did she recommend 10? We don't know. We recommended 11. You know, the applicant asked for eight. That question needs to go to the decision maker and the decision maker would be the hex. And those are the types of questions that we would anticipate she being present for to answer the board's factual inquiries. Okay, and then, and then so we would get the factual answer from her and then if we wanted advice on what might be the most defensible to go with, then we turn to our attorney's office. To... Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the Board of County Commissioners is my client. My duty is to the board. If there's something patently unlawful, I'm going to jump up and down and state my position. Absolutely. That's my duty. That's my obligation. I don't necessarily anticipate that happening under this system. But we stand ready to jump up and down. And what would happen with the hex in that situation with that scenario, she would go back to our code that we approved and say that for this type of use of a gas station, under ADA for handicapped spaces, this many square footage, you're going to allow this many spaces based upon this formula. The staff probably be looking at the same thing to a certain point. I mean, so you could have a different opinion. I'm not sure why applicant would ask for more or less, but you, you're going to, that's going to happen though. But that's what she would do. I, if I was a hex, I would come back and say, well, based upon your code, use, trips, this is what's recommended for this square footage. and. And this was my thought process behind issuing an order that recommended 10 parking spaces. Maybe, maybe she has a reason and we're not privy to that reason. We're not privy to when she's drafting her orders. Yeah. I'm willing to explore with y'all for sure. I mean, you know, I, I think it's a, I think it's a, a interesting, um, interesting way to do it. I can tell you, from a couple times when I got to chair meetings where they were in disagreement, that is not a fun place to be chair. <laughs> that is not a fun place to be. <laughs> if, I, if I could just, you know, on that note, yeah. your staff heard you yeah. clearly. And that is part of the revised process that I described earlier. And hopefully you have not witnessed that and we have in recent yeah. memory. No, we haven't. You're because right. Because we've worked amongst ourselves and bought into the pyramid concept that our bite at the apple as staff is before the hex. She then takes that in an insulated fashion and issues a recommended order to the Board of County Commissioners. Yeah. We don't get to stand in front of you anymore and say, but it should be 11 parking spaces. Uh, there's always for every action, there's a reaction. And for one of the reaction, if you did have the hex come before us for every hearing examiner's meeting, either the chief hearing examiner or assistant, Amanda, that's going to be draw away from their office. They're going to say they need more staffing because it's taking time away from them hearing cases and seeing cases. So that's the downside. It helps expedite our process. It would help expedite the process for the applicants. So it makes it maybe could be a little bit easier than hearing examiners for us. But in turn, her office is going to be, it'd be a staff driven issue where they're preparing to come to those meetings. They're going to, have to take time off from having hearings across the street. Just throwing it out there. Uh, Obviously, she's invited to come back to the next meeting. One thing we could also do individually as commissioners is meet with the hex and talk to her about these ideas and one-on-one -on -one and see what she thinks about it, too. You know, I recommend that, too, if somebody wants to do that, too. And then still have her in the future at a workshop or, or at the meetings when we have this come back, you know. And Mr. Chair? Yes. <clears throat> By all means, if this becomes a resource issue for the hearing examiner, I'm prepared to give up a couple of positions. Okay. Uh, that she can have to help out. Great. Okay. There you go. There's a problem solved then on that, so it's not a resource issue. Thank you. Okay, so we're done with that. Move on to the next one. Okay. Well, the last item we had for you today was an update of the noise ordinance. Um, currently, the way our ordinance is set up, this A level weighting network is what we use, which, which measures mid range. Uh, frequencies um, that are audible to the average person. We did get a request to expand this to include the C range, uh, C weighted network um, to cover those lower bass sounds, which we've all heard in the car that's going by on the street and shaking the windows. 
Um, that would be consistent actually with how the, the town of Port Myers Beach and City of Cape Coral have their ordinances um, established and the, the sheriff's office has the equipment to enforce that because they also enforce the town of Fort Myers Beach ordinance. Um, the issue that uh, Mr. Single raised earlier uh, about the um, pure tones, we uh, are going to have to do some more research on that and, and look at whether what we need to change within our ordinance based on on the information that he provided so there may be further changes based on that um, and i know captiva has some concerns about noise ordinance issues for that are captiva specific and they've raised those to us So we're, we're back to the question, which uh, if we're going to have another work session, maybe we don't need to uh, answer this question today. Um, I did want to take an opportunity uh, before we wrap up to, uh, to thank Amanda Swindle from the County Attorney's Office and Anthony Rodriguez, our zoning manager, and his staff in preparing all of these changes, these revisions. Um, and I want to thank Glenn and, and Sam from County Administration for their help in preparing the presentation. Dave, I do want to bring up one, something, one thing, like I'm sorry to get with you earlier about it too, is in the future we can maybe discuss it too, is um, another path we've talked about a couple years ago. Uh, the state of Florida is recognizing now as far as development. Uh, some people call them this uh, extra quarters. Some people call them mother-in-law quarters. I know in Collier County, other counties, surrounding areas, uh, you can have a large house with the uh, garage and a additional bedroom, 12 by 12 bedroom added to the garage. And some people call them mother-in-law quarters without getting a doghouse. I'm going to call it the guest quarters. Um, <laughs> so um, I know the past, I know we've had this discussion and staff we had, where you would consider it's an extra residency and we weren't allowed in Lee County. Um, a lot of the builders were actually having models that were designed for these quarters. And now I think the state's recognizing that as a, 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 a need or necessity. It's a, this a recognizing a necessity. A necessity. So can we look at that again maybe and discuss it further in the future um, about how we can adopt that? I know the current community has already developed with the 50, 40, 50, 60 lot sizes probably would not be adequate for that. But if you're building a home on a you know, acre site, for example, and there are some acre sites now being built, even off of Corsica Road, if you wanted to have a residency, single family residency, if you added a, an extra room off from the side of the house that's attached to the house, why would that be, have to be considered an extra residency if you want to put it there for a family member that has a health issue? It could be somebody that's a senior, you need, they're taking care of home care or somebody, or just a living quarters for an extra addition to the family. So We, we can uh, take an additional look at that. We've actually been working through with the builders on some of that. And the issue isn't so much the extra room. It's when the extra room is locked off from the main part of the house and it has a separate entrance. Right. That, that that gets into a gray area in terms of density and number of units. So we've been working with the builders on, on these mother-in-law suites or generational units. So they got all kinds of names for the the product that they sell. From that. So we can we can take a look at that and make sure everything's I mean, everybody's, people's lives are changing through the years, obviously not because of the pandemic, but either health issues or quality of life issues and people, uh, not everybody may not want to go to assisted living facilities or someplace that has that. And you have a house. Like I said, some of the communities are at 40, 50 foot lot size. They're not going to build anything with an extra room off set off other than a 40, 50 foot lot. But the larger home size, if it's adequate, you have room to build an extra, you already got 4,000 square foot house, you build an extra 200 feet. I know the quarter span could be, it could be attached to the house without a separate locking door. That could that could occur too. Some of the floor plans could have that, but it's on the other side of the garage though. So I guess if the door's not locking, it wouldn't constitute that then, correct? I know. Because then you, you got kind of get into the rental where you have like a rooming house people top of have, they have, have a separate lock. And I know from working with City Code before, we used to use that once you get inside a house and the rooms actually had numbers on the doors and they actually had individual locks, then you're running a rooming house and it's a hotel, motel. So um, don't want that. I'm just trying to make for people's lives or um, our lives are changing every day. People right, working yeah. from home now. And this is something you know, other counties are doing it. You know, the surrounding, we should be able to find a way to add, acquire that too. 
Yeah, we're trying to keep up with the trends in the market. And, and yeah. I just want to ensure the board that this isn't the end of it in terms of this set of topics. We still are working on additional uh, LDC amendment revision packages to bring forward to you. We're going to be looking at the use codes for our for our conventional rezoning categories and what the allowable uses are. One of the things we got to accommodate is man caves. That's a, a, a market trend. Um, we also need to update our requirements related to proportionate share calculations and and uh, sidewalks and that sort of stuff. You have the the handout we got this morning from the speaker this morning from Wobble. You have I, that. Speaker? I do have that. Yes, sir. Okay, you got one too. I wasn't sure if you got one or not because I know you said you're going to review that. I think the county attorney mm -hmm. got one too, and you're going to review that. And let us know about the pure tones and how that constitutes how other counties and cities are monitoring that. Okay. Commissioner Sandelli. Uh, Dave, the, uh, we're talking about making some adjustments here, um, whether you call it a mandate or just an adjustment, so on and so forth. Do you, do you realistically, realistically believe we have the ability to, to enforce it? Uh, you know, you get somebody goes by, rattles windows with uh, 12 boom boxes in their car. I don't know what capacity the, the, the sheriff's office has or, or it's coming from a home and stuff. I mean. So it involves two things. It involves one is some kind of device to measure the reading, and number two, somebody to go out and actually enforce it. And I don't expect a clear answer here, but obviously it's got to be part of this type of thing. I mean, that is a consideration with every regulation we, we put in place or update. Is is it enforceable? And, and that's an issue with our current noise ordinance now. I mean, people complain about a particular noise. But the sh a sheriff's deputy has to actually go out there, actually has to observe it and measure it with the with the decibel meter, to be able to uh, issue a notice to somebody. But Commissioner, that, that's conversation as well about who actually does the uh, the enforcement work. Yeah, that's. I mean, I, I think that the work that's been done all makes sense. The question though is, is how do you measure it? And how do you enforce it? Otherwise, it's, it's moot. So, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Are you through? I'm through. Yes. I'm done. You made reference to that, Mr. Single. Was that with his name this morning? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I read the little pass out he had it. It just sounded very erudite and like he knew what he was talking about, and I didn't. Uh, <laughs> but you are following up on whatever he suggestions that he made. Yes, sir. Because we, when he got through, we just ignored him like we do everybody else and said, this isn't for a discussion. Thank you for your input. Are you single? With a C. Aren't you pleased that we're paying attention to you? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but I, you were in and out of uh, the noise ordinance too quick for me. What was broken that you were suggesting we fix? All, all we were suggested. We were adding a, a range um, of measurement for what's called the C-weighted scale, which is the lower level sounds, the bass level sounds. Is that the car next to me that do, doing all the boom, boom, boom? Well, let me suggest a main, uh, a way to fix that an ordinance that would allow us to ask him to roll down the window so we could toss a hand grenade. <laughs> I'm serious. I would, I, I'm a good Christian soul, but I would kill. I hate those noises that go boom, they going boom, down North River Road? I can hear the motorcycles three miles away off of 82 in my neighborhood at nighttime. Two o'clock in the morning, you hear the motorcycles down Colonial, and I'm three, four miles away from them. You can hear those things all night long. And the music too, but yeah. You know. Well, give him some suggestions. So, so just the history. Uh, George is here today. George and his wife's here today. So they live in Wild Blue, uh, on the northern end of Wild Blue towards Lico. Um, they don't have any issues with the active mining on Lico. They don't have a problem with the drag lines. They don't have any noise concerns. But on the Lico south side, southeastern quarter, where Youngquest operates the rock pit. They had, since 2015, been allowing a company to build, um, make press pavers there. So the noise they hear, it's a few miles away. I forgot the exact, I got it off. It's 1.6 miles away into air to land, but um, it was them pressing the pavers for like a 20 second interval, pressing the pavers to compress them to get the moisture out of the pavers. That's the noise they can hear during their operating during the day. So some things I'm thinking hopefully we can, I've been out there three different times. I've not heard, the times I've gone, I've not heard it, but 
if when they're operating, we can possibly even get our code enforcement people to have them actually close the doors for the with the warehouse they're working out of, will actually probably reduce a lot of the noise. If they're operating with the doors open, it makes a big difference. But it's, you know, it's quite as that area builds up, we're going to have more residences being built out there. You're going to hear all the different type of industrial type of uses going on out there. And as we expand Alico Road, we're going to have more truck noise and more noises out there along with the boom boom music. So it's going to part of um, growing pains, I guess it is. So I'm staff's working hire on the that. senior guys. We can't. We can't hear much anymore anyhow, so it's not. Well, <laughs> I don't funny, the older I get, the quieter those <laughs> boom boxes get. <laughs> Commissioner Ryan? Um, Dave, maybe just uh, give me the 30,000 foot uh, view on generators. On generators? Generators, yeah. Their ability to exercise what we do, just, you know, just trying to do that. I see there's a... A potential codification, you know, when we have a power outage, but outage. But what do we, you know, what do we do with them? So I'm just trying to understand. What you know, what what what's what's I mean, what's what's I mean, if somebody's operating a generator on a regular basis for some reason other than for exercise, you know, so they obviously if you have one, it, it needs to exercise once a week. Needs to go on for 10 minutes. Just trying to understand, make sure I have clarity. I, I mean, th th that kind of thing is permissible because that's a short duration. It's over. Is there an exception in, in the LDC? Is there a, a decimal item that we have to? When I was in Sanibel, I had to buy a particular generator to adhere to a particular decibel. So I had limitations. We have decibel levels established in the ordinance related to these measuring scales. So they would have to exceed that. Um, and Usually, if it's a short duration, the, the the response to deal with it is turn it off. You know, so I guess my question is: when we crafted the ordinance, um, did we look at four or five different manufacturers, make sure they would be in compliance? I don't. I don't know that we did that in terms of. <clears throat> and the reason why I bring it up it was painful throughout the process when I was in Santa Bell because there was a specific one to do, and today in the supply shortage world that we live in, to be limited to a specific generator to adhere to our specific decibel. To me, when we had exceptions for leaf blowers that were like at 90 decibels and we couldn't exercise a generator, it had to adhere to 72 or lower. I just am trying to get clarity on that. It seemed bizarre back then. You know, we're encouraging people to leave their homes. We're encouraging them to do all the things. They go out and do this, at least in my neighborhood. Um, I think every one of my neighbors has a a generator and just curious more than anything else. Maybe you can circle back with me on noise and I might have a few more questions. Okay, we can do that. Thank you. Yeah. I'm through listening now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you shared it with us. What'd you say? You don't have any history. <laughs> Mr. Man, I was hoping you share some more history stories with us today. No? Well, I got a lot of it still to spew out. Or did, you gonna go turkey hunting this month or not? You staying home? I don't do it anymore. You don't do it anymore. Okay. Good. I commit myself. I got pictures of some turkeys the other day for you. County commission. I got some pictures last week to show you. I was like, "There's a turkey out there." I'm commissioner man, it's like. I did our uh, airport. Off, actually, I was coming back from George's house. They were actually off on Lico, on the north side of Lico. There. Yeah, they're right there on a the building site. Four big turkeys, big gobblers. We've got anything else, Dave? an inspection out there. Okay, that's it. Anything else, Roger? Very much. No, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, we, we appreciate your time and uh, consideration on these topics today, and we'll, um, we'll, uh, we'll be back to talk, you, talk with you some more about them soon. Okay. We'll be adjourned. Thank you. Have a great